Hey everyone, it's Catherine, and it's Saturday morning, June 20th, 2020. It is the summer solstice. It is the longest day of the year in what is seemingly the longest year we have all ever had. Uh, I'm really excited about the future, and I wanted to share some real estate advice for those of you who are curious about how you can make money in real estate, uh, whether it's your first time purchasing a property or you're looking for another means to invest aside from the stock market or you know wherever you're you're keeping your money currently uh, i am a licensed real estate agent in philadelphia pennsylvania specifically and i have worked with a ton of investors over the last nine years i guess um, so I'm going to show you uh, what that looks like. It's only going to be a couple of minutes, so uh, just follow along. What we're looking at right now, screen-wise, is what's called the MLS. And MLS is a search queue, not unlike Zillow or Realtor.com or Trulia, which are all accessible for anyone. The MLS is only accessible for uh, licensed real estate agents who have memberships. Okay, so it's where, it's called a multiple listing service. It's where all agents put their listings on and there are notes in there that agents can see. There's access information for lockbox codes and things of that nature. So uh, I am searching on MLS and I'm searching for multifamily properties in the Philadelphia marketplace. And I'm searching for multifamily properties, which means it's a property that contains more units than just one single family, but multiple units. And I'm doing this because it is my belief, and we're going to go over some of the facts in a second, that you can purchase a multifamily property uh, right out of the gate as your very first property as an investment because you can end up making money above and beyond what your mortgage payments are. And that leads to passive income. So eventually you can pay off the mortgage in a shorter time frame, or you can hang on to it and just have that cash flow that comes in on top of the mortgage that you can put some aside for repairs or emergencies and or you know in, reinvest it into additional properties. So I don't even put in a lot of criteria here except for what's active or coming soon onto the market because I'm, I know exactly where I'm looking in the fringy neighborhoods of Philadelphia. And I say fringy because they're the neighborhoods that haven't become so popular that they're overpriced yet. All right, so I'm gonna click on the map here. And I live in Sharswood. This is my neighborhood right here, which has a ton of development opportunity. Ridge Avenue is seen a ton as well. And that connects all the way out to Fairmount Park. Now, Brewery Town has been blowing up recently. I just sold uh, right here at 31st and Oxford, the highest price per square footage in the Brewery Town neighborhood at $403 per square foot. That is a condo building built by Equinox Construction and Management. Um, hopefully I'll get John Weiss on my podcast soon so you guys can check that out. But so this neighborhood is rapidly developing and with good reason. This is Fairmount Park. This is the largest urban park in the United States. It is located in the middle of the city. We have the Schuylkill River that runs through it. There's Kelly Drive, um, Martin Luther King Boulevard, also known as West River Drive. I like to call it Martin Luther King Drive. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Tons of outdoor activities. Right here, right across from where I'm looking, you can see I've already checked off some of these boxes. There is uh, the new bike rentals, which Philadelphia implemented a few years ago. There's a uh, driving range, so you can actually you know, practice your swing if you're a golfer. There is a Frisbee golf course in here that's been around for ages. They actually added an additional, I think it's 18 holes, some five to seven years ago. Um, there's the reservoir, there's tennis courts that are located over here, there's amazing picnic areas for people, uh, and then there's some old uh, estate homes that I like to go take my dogs running around. So there's just a little bit. Strawberry Mansion is one of my favorite neighborhoods. I think that the architecture there is some of the, the most beautiful architecture in all of Philadelphia, aside from maybe Spruce Hill and West Philadelphia, where I also used to live. Uh, I am kind of nerdy about that stuff, so it's it's definitely one of my favorite neighborhoods. Now, in terms of uh, demographics of people who live here, you have a lot of folks 
who are uh, locals, not necessarily people or a huge flux of new residents in this area, but you're starting to see that push as neighborhoods get developed a little bit, properties get renovated, new folks move in. So if you live in this neighborhood already, don't move. Uh, talk to me about what your financial circumstances are, and we'll see if we can either partner you with somebody to purchase your first property, uh, which is what I'm hopefully going to be doing in in the near future, and or uh, you know get your credit and and finances figured out, and we can you know allow you to reap some of the rewards of this developing neighborhood that you already live in. So. Let's take a look at some properties. Now, these two I've checked off for, for other reasons, but I really wanna look at this one. This area right here along the park, there's a bit of a hill. You can't really see the grade here. So you don't see too much into the park, but you are right on it. So these streets are really wide and open. There's tons of room for um, you know parking and uh, just the houses themselves are really beautiful. So this address, 3236 West Berks, I'm gonna go ahead and look that up on Google so you can take a peek. This is another property I was looking at. Oops, let's go back. Let's take a look. All right, so here we are. All right, and we're just which we're just in off of the park here. You have the 33rd Street and Burke's uh, bus line that runs through. And there's there's great bike lanes here now. Again, I just said that there's you know bike rentals across the street. So let's take a look. This is the property, right? Thirty-two, 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 thirty-six. I think one of them should be thirty-two, thirty-six, right here on the end. You can do that by counting because we go even number. So 32, 32, 34, 36, and this is what we're looking for. So it's an N unit. We're gonna go down to the N and just kind of see what's up. You're not allowed to have windows on the other side um, when it's abutting another property that's classic Philly. So you have really, really uh, beautiful architecture here. I wanna zoom in a little bit so you can take a peek. Some of the original detail of the corbels, beautiful arches in the windows. You've got this beautiful bay with some of the tin and ornate detail, which is nice. It hasn't been covered up by siding, which I fucking hate who like stop putting siding on buildings like that. It looks terrible, but you know, sometimes they can't afford to do it a different way. You have this wrought iron here and little fencing steps, nice outdoor porch. It looks like they have retrofitted air conditioning, so not ideal, but again, this was in July of 2019, so it might look different in person. So here's a location. You've got four row homes in a row and some outdoor space right near Natrona. And what do we got here? It looks like a school building or an office sort of across the street. Some vacant land might be a parklet. And then you have 33rd Street. So you're actually looking out onto Fairmount Park. This is blocked off here. Um, sometimes you'll see like the, the West Philly Cowboys coming through. They just made a movie about that. There's actually a lot of people who ride horses in West Philadelphia, including um, Brewtown and Strawberry Mansion. Along the water, there's actually stables. So there's that. So this is the block, right? It's pretty clean. You've got new pavement on this side, some mature trees, and then you have classic row homes, right? These people with the, the We Buy Houses signs, that's how you know you're in a neighborhood that uh, might be gentrifying soon. You got a lot of properties, people want to sell and just move out. So it's a good sign for investors, sorta. Uh, not always a good sign for people who live in the neighborhood. So you want to be mindful of that. If you see those kind of signs, it means people are trying to buy at the neighborhood. All right. So let's get back to this property, the listing that is. Um, 3236 West Berks, it's listed for 427,900, so roughly 428,000. Um, people often price things like this just so that it comes in under what somebody's maximum range is when they're searching online. Um, you know, I can see who's selling the property, how many days it's been on the market, the size of the property, the actual lot dimensions, which is helpful if you're looking for a project, if you're going to renovate or you're going to try to change the use from a single family to a multifamily or what have you. The last time it was sold in 2019 for 160. So there's a good sign that the neighborhood is growing. Somebody purchased this for 160,000. It looks like it's had some renovations just by the, the shiny new flooring. Um, and the paint color on the walls is that like classic gray <clears throat> that has really just been a new, a new thing over the last like 10 years. So 
it's got updates clearly. So let's go ahead and click on it. And it's an active multifamily for 428,000. It just came on the market about five days ago and they already dropped the price a couple thousand dollars. So I guess they thought they were gonna get some hits right away and they didn't. It's been a weird week. We've had a lot of protests going on, um, which I'm all for, Black Lives Matter, let's do this. Uh, and crazy fireworks, rioting, a pandemic. So a lot of properties are starting to take a little bit of a dip because they're not getting the attention that they want, but it's the summertime and people aren't paying attention. So if it were me, I wouldn't be dropping that price, but good for me if I'm considering buying. So let's keep going. Uh, here's your annual taxes. And this is good if you're looking at a property that you're gonna renovate. This year, you could still apply for building permits to renovate a property and get a tax abatement. However, that is slowly changing and going away for a number of reasons. It's not going to be around forever. So it's important to check your taxes and consider that when you uh, finally budget for your expenses. The tax assessed value of the property is how the city assesses taxes. So after the property sells, if there's not an abatement, the t new taxes will be based on presumably the sale price. At least that's what we want to estimate when we are considering how much we're spending. Now, um, they're putting it, it's an eight cap rate in here. The cap rate uh, of a property is something that we use when we're analyzing an investment. And it really just means your net operating income. So after, you know, what your revenue for the property is minus all of your expenses is your net operating income. If you take that amount and you divide it by the sales price, that's going to give you your cap rate. Um, it's an eight cap, which essentially means if you're, you know, if your income divided by your sale price is 0.08, that's your that's your cap rate. Okay, they've got some operating expenses listed in here. A lot of people don't actually post that. That's fine, but you wanna figure out what your own operating expenses are going to be if you get into the property. So what your insurance is, how much your uh, debt services, if you're getting financing, what your property management fees are going to be if you're hiring somebody else, what your vacancy rate might be. We usually estimate 5%. If it's a growing neighborhood, you might wanna take that up a little bit higher. It might be more challenging for you to find a tenant. Those sort of things are important. All right, and then here we have the description. This is what everybody reads on Trulia and on Zillow. Amazing strawberry mansion opportunity to live in one unit and rent the other. And this is the type of property that um, that I think everybody should be purchasing as their very first home if they are trying to establish financial freedom, passive income, or grow their personal wealth through real estate. You can purchase any property that you want when you buy a home, but if you purchase a multifamily or something that's gonna give you an income or, or balance out how much you're spending on your mortgage, that's gonna get you to pay off that property quicker. You're gonna be able to reap the appreciation and get passive income long-term. So we're gonna take um, this example, and by the end of this, I'm gonna tell you how to make <laughs> $120,000 a year passive income within the next 10 years. Here we go. All right. So here's the description of the property. They say that it's two units. Unit one is three bedrooms, three bathrooms with two laundry areas and a lower family room with a private deck. Outdoor space is key in Philadelphia. People love that shit. All right. Unit two is a four bedroom, two full bathroom with a laundry room and a roof hatch. Roof deck could easily be added. Now that's an opportunity to add a little bit of value. You could potentially even rent um, a little bit higher. Now it does say that unit two has a two year lease at $1,900 a month and unit one has applicants but isn't actually rented because they're trying to push the sale of this property for an owner occupant. Now, when you purchase a property that is a multifamily but you're going to be an owner occupant, you can generally get similar interest rates and similar down payment limitations that you would on a standard private residential purchase. So, at 429,000 estimated income here, we are going to see what our uh, actual closing cost estimates are going to be. Now, I've already done this here. We actually have a, uh, a link on here when we do this. If you hit 
buyer's closing cost estimates. It'll actually take you to a screen where we fill in a bunch of information. So I'm going to show you that here. Now, buyer's estimated closing cost. Now, it usually takes, today's June 20th, it usually takes about 30 to 45 days to close on a property. Depending on the type of financing that you're getting, it could take a little bit longer because there's a lot of people who have to process information in order to get that money funded to you. So I gave a little bit of time to July 30th. Now, this Settlement date is relevant because you're going to owe taxes back to the seller of the property for the remainder of the year. So the date does change how much money you're going to actually need to purchase the property in closing. I put 3% as a down payment because that is generally the very minimum that you will need to spend in order to purchase a property. Now, Back when I was a child or when my parents were younger and they were considering buying a home, people used to put 15 to 25% down as a standard. Mm, hardly anybody does that anymore. Most people put down anywhere between 3 and 10%. At least that's my experience for all of my first-time buyers. So uh, I put 3% down. That's the very minimum, all right? So your mortgage is going to be uh, essentially 97% loan-to-value, for $428,000, 97% of that is roughly 415. I put an interest rate of 3%. I am seeing interest rates right now, if you have amazing credit, at 2.75%. Now that depends on a lot of things. It depends on your credit. It depends on the term of the loan. If it's longer term, your interest rate's gonna be a little bit higher. If it's a shorter term, it could potentially be less. Depends. Um, but 3% right now is totally doable, which is insane. You realize you, like, interest rates used to be like 10%. Interest rates, when everybody was saying, hey, refinance, refinance, they were at 4.5%. We're now at 2.75% to 3.25%, um, which is insane. So if you can obtain financing to purchase a property, you should definitely do it. If you already own a property and you haven't refinanced in the last couple of years, you should talk to me and I will connect you with a lender. Okay, so closing costs. This is an itemized breakdown of all of the fees and costs that are associated with purchasing. And this is an estimate right? So I try to be somewhat conservative in my estimates. Um, this one is pretty pretty realistic. Depending on your lender, there might be a difference in fees depending on um, you know who does conveyancing. They might charge you a little bit different for things like recording fees, notary fees, etc. So take it with a grain of salt. All right, your mortgage origination fee. I put a standard uh, fee in here for $1,500 at $400,000 purchase. Credit reports, appraisal costs. This is generally going to be a little bit higher. Four hundred thousand for a multifamily is kind of low. You might go up another hundred. Um, wires, couriers, underwriting, etc. Here you have your transfer tax. Now this is important based on your location. The city of Philadelphia has a uh, one percent tax that's added onto the state tax, which is at like three point two eight percent. So. 4.28% divided by two because the transfer taxes are split between the buyer and the seller, and that's $9,000. So that's something to consider. When you sell a property, you're gonna be paying that as well. Um, you're not just gonna be making all the income off of it, and there's other fees that are associated, but this is for the buying side. Deed recording fees, homeowner's insurance. Now this changes depending on the type of property that you have. Um, I put $1,000 in here, this could be higher or less. Home inspection, typically for a single family home, your home inspection, including termites and radon, which I just lumped into this amount, I didn't itemize it here, is gonna be about $600, but this is a multifamily, so I generally go up. I've had multifamilies inspected at three units for 900. This is a two unit, but it's a four and a three bedroom, so I, I, uh, I did go up a little bit higher than what I normally would for a two. Okay, uh, capitalization funding and condo move-in fees are not relative. Usually capitalization fee is two months worth of condo fees when you move in, but that's not relevant here. Title insurance, I have an enhanced sale policy. Title insurance fees are regulated by the state of Pennsylvania, so they're generally the same no matter who you choose for your title. It does matter who you choose for title insurance because not all title agents and their teams are as savvy as others. They don't necessarily do as many deals or maybe they um, you know, have personality flaws that just make them slower than others. So be mindful, you wanna choose a good title company. I have plenty that I work with. All right, escrows. Escrows mean essentially money that's held, all right? So taxes, 
homeowners insurance, condo fees if they're relevant, and then mortgage insurance fees. Those are all um, processed by the title company at closing. It's where money changes hands because you're paying to move in and reimbursing the seller for payments that they've already made on these type of things. Okay, transaction summary, um, and then ongoing payments. So your purchase price, I didn't even change this. I just left it at what they're asking. Closing costs, 17368 Now that's a, an estimate, but it's a pretty good one. So closing costs can be uh, decreased. You can decrease the amount of closing costs you pay at settlement by doing a couple of things. One is called a seller assist, and that is essentially asking for a credit from the seller. So they're going to net less whatever amount you're asking for. Sometimes you can still net the seller what they're asking for by increasing the sale price and asking for a seller assist. That essentially loops the cost of closing into your mortgage. However, you wanna make sure that your spread isn't so much that the appraisal value is not gonna come in less than what the loan value now has to be. Otherwise, you won't be able to get funding. So, moving forward. Uh, Closing costs 17,000, but we're gonna go down here and look at the estimated cash needed to purchase. Now this is the total amount of money that you need to purchase this property, all right? There's some fees that you're gonna have to pay prior to settlement, meaning before you get to the closing table, and that's things like inspections, appraisal fees, lender fees, et cetera. And then at the end of the day, it's really, you know, this is how much money you need to close that day when you get the keys to the property. Ongoing monthly payments, principal and interest, okay? Real estate taxes, now this is likely to go up, so you wanna estimate based on the sale price of the property what your taxes might be, and that could be a few hundred dollars more a month at the end of the day, so take that into consideration. Um, homeowner's insurance, again, that varies slightly. Mortgage insurance, now this is what we call um, PMI for short, or primary mortgage insurance. If you spend less than 20%, down when you purchase a property, generally speaking, you will have to pay mortgage insurance because you don't have that much skin in the game. So the lender is taking a risk to loan you that money because if you default, it's not like you have so much equity in the property. The seller, the, the bank, if they end up with the property, they're going to have to sell it at roughly what you paid for it because they don't have, they haven't made any money off of it yet, right? So primary mortgage insurance. Sometimes you can pay for that primary mortgage insurance at settlement in a lump fee to essentially buy down the cost, all right? So here's your estimated monthly payment. You can purchase, this is what this whole thing is saying. I'm gonna summarize it. You can purchase a duplex. There's two units, right? So that's a duplex as opposed to a triplex, which would be three. You can purchase a duplex in Strawberry Mansion near Fairmount Park for $428,000, all you're spending to purchase that property is 32, let's say, th we'll round up and say $33,000. And your monthly payment on that mortgage is going to be $2,272, roughly, okay? If we go back to this listing, all right, and we read what it says, Unit two has a two year lease and is rented, it's already rented, for $1,900 a month, okay? So you have 22, let's say $2,300 a month to 19, all right? So you're paying $400 a month to your mortgage and you still have a vacant unit. Now, if this four bedroom unit is getting $1,900 a month, that's roughly $500 per bed. Then this three bedroom, three full bath unit, which I think is actually a little bit higher, I think you could probably get more than $500 a month just because everybody has their own bathroom and there's outdoor space. Hello, people love that. Um, I think one of, the, one of the issues here is that it's on the ground floor, but $1,500 a month for this three bedroom, right? And that's market value in this neighborhood. There's easy parking. It's a recent renovation, so you shouldn't have a lot of updates or upkeep. $1,500 a month. So let's go to here. Let's go to our calculator. If we are making $1,900 a month on unit one, plus if we can make another $1,500 on unit two, 
That's $3,400 a month in revenue. That's income only or, or you know revenue, what you're getting from your, from your tenants, rental income. Now, if you're making $3,400 a month, but you're spending $2,200 That means you're making $1,200 a month, okay? So if you rent out that other unit for $500 a bed or $1,500 a month, you are now making $1,200 a month for doing nothing. Now it costs you $32,000 to make $1,200 a month, right? $1,200 a month times 12. It's roughly $14,000 a year. Let's see, minus taxes and any maintenance because it's newer. Oh, what did I just do here? Let's go. We got income. We'll just we'll add up all the income and expenses. We'll find out what your actual income is going to be for the whole year. And then we'll minus what your bits are, right? So we've got $1,500 plus. $1,900, $3,400 a month, okay, times 12 equals $40,000 a year, all right? So that's the income from owning this property, or rather it's the revenue from owning this property, the rental income. Now we're going to minus what your mortgage payment is. So we have $40,800, let's remember what that is, seventy two. Times 12 equals 27264. $13,000 a year. Let's minus your taxes. I'm estimating up here because the taxes were less. They're only a thousand, but I'm adding taxes and then ancillary expenses. This is if you're, you're just managing the property on your own. It's $8,500 a year in income, in income, okay? $8,500 a year in income. You spent $32,000 to get into this property, and in a year, you're gonna make back 25% of what you spent, which means this house, what you, what you spent to buy this house will be paid off in four years. Now the house won't be paid off. You'll still have this mortgage payment, but what you initially spent, that $32,000, what you spent to get into that property, you'll get back in four years, okay? Now, if you add value to the property, if you increase the rents over that time, um, you will obviously make more money. Now, if we multiply this times 10 years, in 10 years, you'll make $85,000. Now. This is one property, there's multiple units, but it's one property, and you have one mortgage on this property. As an individual, you have an opportunity to get up to 10 mortgages, 10 mortgages, all right? So if you're making $8,500 a year passive income from owning one property, and you times it by 10, that's $85,000 a year passive income. In 10 years, if you keep doing this, now this is one property, this is one example, you're gonna roughly be making $85,000 a year in passive income. Now you will have to pay taxes on this because it's passive income, but there's a lot of ways in which you can save on your taxes, depending on how you structure it, depending on how you own it, if you own it as an LLC, if you own it as a partnership, if you're an S corporation, if you donate money to nonprofit organizations, etc. Right? So here's another tip, what I would do if I were purchasing my very first property and I didn't want to still pay rent elsewhere. It only costs you 22, right? If you're 20, you're in your late 20s, early 30s and you live in Philadelphia, you are probably like 75% likely to have a roommate 
which is super common, especially now, people like living with each other. So if it if if you only have a $400 a month payment and you have a three bedroom house or three bedroom bi-level unit that you can live in, one of those bedrooms can be yours and you can rent out the other two bedrooms for you know, 500 a piece. So if you're getting $1,000 from one unit, 1,900 from the other, and now you're making 2,900, but your mortgage payment is only 2,200, you're, you're paying yourself $700 a month to live somewhere. Let that soak in for a second. Now you have to pay this amount of money in order for that to happen. You you need to save $32,000 in order for that to happen. But this is how I would do it because I'm a real estate agent. And I highlighted this earlier. So let's, we're going to take a look. This is the listing, right? This is the property itself. You can see the photos. They had it painted. Here's a street view. Some of the units, right? It's your basement unit. You can still easily rent that out for $500 per bedroom. Nice bathrooms, cute kitchen, little outdoor deck. Hello, thank you. Laundry, everybody loves that. Little bay windows. Cute, right? Nothing too fancy, but it's clean and it's new. New appliances, gas range, blah, 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 near the park. Easy. This is the listing. Compensation for being a real estate agent and selling this property is 3% of gross. So that means if we add a seller assist in, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the, the seller is going to net, whatever their gross sales price is going to be after any concessions, I make 3% of that. Now, if you're going to be purchasing real estate as an investor to own for yourself, and you're gonna be purchasing it on MLS, you're not trying to swindle somebody, you're trying to do everything by the book because real estate agents have ethical guidelines that we have to abide by. As uh, my partner used to say, there's two different types of real estate agents. There's one who will say, how much money do you wanna make when you sell your property? And those are generally real estate agents who buy property for themselves. And then there's another who will say, I will tell you exactly what your property is worth. And I'll sell it for that amount because I'm trying to help you. And that's what you, know, that's what you want. You want number two, not necessarily number one. Um, but if you are an active real estate agent who's purchasing, or rather if you're an active investor who's going to be purchasing real estate, get your fucking real estate license because I can purchase this property myself without putting any money down because the compensation to me as a buyer's representative even if I'm representing myself, is 3%, which means I don't have to put any money down. So if I look at my closing cost, right, this is the amount of money that I need. Maybe lender escrows too, right? So you're looking at roughly $19,000, $20,000 as opposed to $28,000. And I know how to save on that already. I can ask, I can increase the mortgage amount a little bit. All right, the properties may be worth a little bit more and I'll, I'll show you how to analyze that in another video. But if I'm only spending $15,000, this is still gonna be my monthly payment. Nothing else changes except I'm now suddenly getting a gift for payment in order to purchase this because I'm doing all the legwork. I'm not hiring somebody else to do it. I'm doing it on my own. Then my return on investment is much higher, right? Because I'm saving myself on that 3%. So... At the end of the day, I could live here, right? I live somewhere down here, right? I live right here. I could live over here and make $700 a month. And it only costs me $15,000. Hell, if I move in the city of Philadelphia, it's going to cost me at least six. Rent plus fees plus moving costs plus time and energy, taking off work, packing, et cetera. It's like $2,000 times three, 6,000 easily. So double that, All right? How long is it gonna take you to save $15,000? Fuck, get your real estate license, sell a couple houses, and put that money into, into, into real estate, right? 
All right, well, uh, that's all I got for today. So I hope you enjoyed that perfect example of what you can do in real estate investing. And uh, if you have questions, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at phillyproper.com. That is my website. You can follow me online. If you're reading this online, just reach out to me, DM. Um, all of my contact info is posted on my business uh, social media accounts. So feel free to shoot me a text or give me a call and uh, I'll set you guys up.